this really gets to a personal passion of mine, how we talk about and interact with our customers, uh, who, what we know about our customers, what we do to truly bring them in. Um, the idea that the, the, making the customer the heart of the co-op might strike some as funny, especially if you're a hardcore cooperator, you might say, well, what about the member? Why isn't the member the heart of the co-op? And we think that that is absolutely true, that the member does distinguish us uh, from a, uh, a business uh, structural perspective. Uh, it gives us great insight into some of our customers. Uh, and it's also a little bit incomplete. Um, if you take that $2.1 billion in annual sales, roughly 65% of our current sales goes to our members. Uh, and that means 35% of our sales, or roughly 750 million of our collective sales comes from non-member shoppers. Uh, and there are a lot of non-member shoppers who are coming to natural foods and for the first time increasing. There's a lot of demand for that, a lot of new interest in that. And so this conversation about what we can do to be welcoming to them is really important. But from our perspective, the making the customer in the heart of the co-op is, is well beyond just customer service. Customer service is really important. And those one-on-one -on -one interactions between people who work at the co-op, the existing members of the co-op, and people who are coming in the door for the first time are critical. But we're actually talking about something much bigger, which is the customer experience overall. It's, it's from everything from the Facebook ad that they see that encourages them to come out to the co-op and, and, and take advantage of some deal that's going on, uh, to their experience in your parking lot, uh, to um, uh, the music, the cleanliness of the store, the conditions of the bathrooms, the availability of the products they're looking for. Yes, that very important customer service, um, what they leave with, and, and even when they get home, the condition with which they, they open their grocery bags and see their groceries in immaculate condition. All of that is part of the customer service, and every step in that journey is an opportunity for us to do something bigger, better, to truly wow them. This is not about meeting their needs. It's about exceeding their needs. It's about going well beyond that. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why we would want to do this. Um, I'm not going to speak to all of these. Uh, for those of you who might not be able to see, um, uh, perpetuity and sustainability, uh, continued relevance and influence, fuel for our impact, the great things that we do, um, critical differenti differentiation in the larger market, and because it is more fun. I want to speak to a couple of these in greater detail, the first being perpetuity and sustainability. Um, a lot of our co-ops right now are looking at their member base and realizing that their, their member segment is getting older, uh, that their boards are getting older, and that a lot of co-ops are really trying to figure out what it takes to reach out to the next uh, group of, of shoppers who are going to come in and eventually participate at the higher level and carry the co-op forward for the next 20 and 30 years. We had a great visit from somebody from the Japanese uh, Consumer uh, Cooperative Union, uh, came to uh, the United States uh, last year, I think they came again, and had a conversation about what those critical issues that we're all experiencing are, and we share a lot of them in common, this being one, but they're at a strategic disadvantage from our food co-ops, because in Japan you, were only, you can only sell to existing members, you cannot sell to non-member shoppers. Um, and so what we have is the ability to take anybody who walks through our door, invite anybody from our community in, give them an amazing experience, even if they're just getting that gallon of milk or that sandwich, and then every time they shop, sort of have a deepening relationship with them so that they do one day participate at the higher level. They buy their membership. They, they work uh, as, a, as a working uh, uh, member. They, they become a staff person. Any of those things that uh, is sort of a higher level of participation really critical, and, and our ability to reach out and wow the customer today is what's going to support our long-term perpetuity and sustainability as cooperative businesses. Today's delighted customer is tomorrow's engaged member or just full-time shopper. The other one I want to talk about, which a lot of people, I think, uh, are laugh at a little bit, is this idea that it's more fun. And, and that is slightly coming from a personal perspective. I've worked for organizations that are really focused on the customer and focused outward towards the community. And I've worked at a lot of organizations that are kind of looking inward a lot. And, and the outward look is uh, way more fun, way more engaging as a staff person at a co-op. And we also see this in the larger market. Um, I know nobody's uh, uh, necessarily a big advocate of Trader Joe's in the co-op circles, but routinely Trader Joe's comes in as sort of the top three 
retailers for that customer experience, that customer engagement. Shoppers feel passionately about Trader Joe's, who sort of who buy into that. And, and simultaneously, Trader Joe's often shows up in the top three in terms of staff satisfaction and staff engagement. We see the same thing with Costco. We see the same thing with Wegmans. There's a correlation between the extent to which we're empowering our existing staff and shoppers to really go above and beyond the, uh, with meeting the needs of our customers and their long-term uh, feelings about liking being a part of the co-op, liking having a job at the co-op. Um, now, in terms of where we fall short, again, I don't necessarily have the time to touch on each one of these lists, but what's interesting is this list was generated mostly by, again, the people who've been watching this presentation, having this conversation with us. Um, not enough focus on non-members is the first bullet point, and I want to speak to that just a little bit. Um, we have a lot of data about who our members are. Co-ops generally do. We typically conduct biannual or annual member survey. We've got customer comment forms. We've got board meetings that they can come to. We've got annual meetings they can come to. We've got lots of vehicles to know what our members want. Um, but in truth, we know that only about 20% of them engage in that level. A lot of people don't fill out those surveys or take that. So we're hearing from a fairly small segment of our existing member base. And we don't have very much data at all to find out what the other members or even the non-member shoppers are really interested in looking for. And as a result, sometimes our direction is informed by the feedback we get from a fairly small subset of our community. So the, the idea of, of this bullet point is just to acknowledge the fact that we could probably really take some time to go out and listen to what the other shoppers are interested in. Are we truly meeting their needs? Uh, kind of going above and beyond just the member. Also recalling that if we really do a great job of meeting the satisfaction of all shoppers, members are also included on that. So this is not exclusive of members. This is inclusive of members and goes beyond it. Um, I, I think you know staff-centric decision making, making product knowledge, uh, mistaking product knowledge for service. Those are pretty straightforward. One of the interesting things that came from our, our our fresh managers this year was this idea that sometimes they feel that they and their employees tend to treat. If you ask them what their work is, you just pull them aside and say, "Okay, here's a here's a clerk. What's your job?" They talk about all the things that touch the product, stocking. Facing, receiving, buying, prep, uh, uh, preparing foods, um, and and that if you really dig into it, sometimes they kind of maybe let on that sometimes they see the customer as a distraction from the real work. And when somebody said this at our conference, there were so many nodding heads. And I think that it's one of those things that we might have invisible structures in our organizations that reinforces this job that the people who work here are really working with product and not necessarily looking to meet the needs of the shoppers. Uh, and a couple great uh, uh, things that people pulled out in that spirit are hiring for product orientation rather than customer orientation. Uh, and I did this when I was a manager too. Oh, you've got grocery experience? Bam, you're in, right? Rather than, wow, this is a really engaging, energetic, friendly person. I would love for this person to meet our customers uh, on behalf of our co-op. Um, another uh, interesting idea is our job titles, um, buyer, stalker. Um, receiver, prep cook, these again, structural things that might reinforce this idea that our job is not necessarily the customer. And the one I thought that was the most insightful is the fact that we in co-ops tend to take our best employees and increasingly promote them away from the customer. So whether that's taking the great uh, cashier and promoting them to a weekday shift between 8 and 4, which is outside of our busiest hours, or whether that's promoting somebody to the back room or to the back office, the folks that we're really excited about as long-term employees, we tend to take them further and further away from the customer. I thought that was really insightful. Um, so just a lot of things that we do that might, we might not even see that are sort of structural to where we might fall short. So what can we do? Um, prioritizing the customer experience. Very straightforward, but also very important. This is about when you're, when you're faced with dozens of competing priorities uh, as a staff person or, or uh, even, even when you're a, a member, a passionate member of the, the co-op going through and shopping, you know, are we noticing those things that might have a negative impact on other customers? Are we noticing when uh, an end cap is running low? Are we noticing when the shopping carts are all wet from the rain and need to be dried off? Um, it, it, it can be hard in a sea of competing priorities to focus on those things that directly impact the customer experience and prioritize those. 
the great example that came up this year about this is, you know, the, the order comes in, the produce order comes in, and instantly all the produce clerks run to the back room to help receive that produce order. Um, and of course, we want to receive, that's important, that's a critical function of the job. Um, but in the meantime, there's not really anybody left on the, pro, the produce sales floor to help customers. So uh, this is very obvious. It's also one of the hardest ones uh, in this set because it requires constant diligence and it requires that all of us really think about carefully what are those things specifically that are going to have a positive or negative impact on the customers that we have to do. Um, this was an interesting concept that kind of came up uh, mid-year and uh, this is a model and I, I'll walk you through it because I know it's a little bit um, hard to see from the back. But this is a model uh, and, and we, we wanted to say, how do most people think of their co-ops relative to the larger community? What we have here is a co-op in the center. The little house is a co-op. Um, in this particular model, I associate myself as a former manager at a co-op with that person standing in the front. Uh, that's me. And my job as a manager is to keep in balance all these different stakeholder perspectives. I've got the vendors, I've got the customers, NCG is on there, uh, uh, the creditors, you know, the staff, the board. I'm in the middle trying to keep all these different stakeholders in, in balance and make sure that they're all being attended to equally. But what's the problem with that? If, if we're truly gonna put the co customer as the heart of our co-op, we need to rethink this model dramatically. And so here's an alternative, where we have the customer at the center, and all those other stakeholder groups are still there. M the manager, myself, I'm not there. Because my job is to orient all these different stakeholder groups towards the customers. In other words, I'm not trying to keep a balance between the vendors and, and the membership. I'm trying to get the members and the, um, the, the vendors to all try and meet, better meet the needs of the customers. We're trying to focus attention on how can we really wow these folks, get them a great experience. And this, this slight, slight change was really resonant with a lot of folks who were coming to our events this year. This really meant a lot to them because this was very much how they conceptualized their job and gave them a very clear idea of how we might conceptualize it differently going forward. Take all the focus and put it on the customers uh, throughout the organization. And doing that, we have a lot greater chance of making them part of the co-op. Um, everyone welcome is more than just a sign. We're going to have conversations about this later today. We are going to have a lot of conversations about this in the coming year. Um, this is a photo of uh, Durham Co-op Market in uh, Durham, North Carolina. And they and several of our co-ops, including Mariposa, are working very, very hard to make sure that their co-ops are inclusive and welcoming of anybody from the community, genuinely welcoming them in, reaching out to uh, people who aren't shopping and inviting them in, asking that question, who's not here, and bringing them in. Uh, and also having the willingness to change and adjust to better meet those individual, those needs. Um, this is really critical for us, and, uh, and, and there's a bunch of different ways in which co-ops, and I think it's co-op dependent where the real opportunities are, but one national opportunity is just to acknowledge the fact that our co-ops tend to not be as diverse as the communities in which they operate. So um, we uh, have several goals, sort of impact goals that we set for co-ops every year. There's about 17 of them so that we can truly live up to our values. And one of those goals is to make sure that the, uh, the percentage of staff at our co-ops who identify as an ethnic minority is representative of the ethnicity of the community in which they operate. And on a national level, if all the co-ops do that, we set a goal that we think we can get to 22%. 22% of our co-op uh, staff identify as an ethnic minority. And that's not to say we stop there. The idea is that we continue to have the conversation about where that should be. But, but when we started this, we were at 17%. So we said, what, what would it take to get to 22%? What would it take to change structurally enough, welcome more people in to be part of our co-op and get to 22%? And unfortunately, it went down. From 2017 to 2016, the number of staff at our co-ops who identified as an ethnic minority went down from 17% to 15%. Clearly, we have a bunch of work to do in this area. And NCG, the co-op that I work for, is not excluded from that. We had feedback this summer uh, from some individuals attending one of our conferences that we are not presenting the kind of leadership that we should present in this area. And we know that's true. It's absolutely true. It's something that our company has been struggling with for a couple of years, and in that how do we address that paralysis, we ended up making no traction. Now, thankfully, early this year, we did start doing things different. Uh, back in the spring, we started interviewing firms. 
to help us take a good, strong look at our organization and determine uh, what it is structurally that we're not seeing that might be um, dissuading uh, persons of color from uh, working at our organization. We do pretty well in terms of gender parity in uh, leadership positions. We do pretty well in terms of uh, sexual orientation, but in terms of, of uh, uh, diversity, in terms of uh, ethnic representation, um, uh, in, in a bunch of other fields, we don't do what we need to be doing. So we said we need help. We invited somebody to come in. And we're embarking on a three-year project to both identify what we need to do and help us change. And I'm going to suggest that all of our co-ops need to be doing this. And a lot of our co-ops are taking the lead. A lot of co-ops are doing the kind of work that it takes to come out there and do this, whether it's reaching out to uh, populations that just don't feel like they're served or would be served by the co-op, bringing them in. A lot of our co-ops have made great strides in recognizing and welcoming uh, persons uh, with non-binary gender identities. A lot of our co-ops have been really great about coming up with low-income programs to invite lower-income folks into our stores. A lot of co-ops are dealing with this in different ways. One of the interesting things, a lot of co-ops recognize that they're really not good at meeting the needs of families with children, that we are not family-friendly places to shop. These are all different ways in which we are failing to necessarily make sure that everyone is welcome at our store. And there are always, this is a long-term project that we're going to have to be doing together, but it's really important because if we fail to live up to our own values around diversity and inclusion, we, we, will, we will alienate those we wish to serve. Um, and, and it's important that we take action on this. People need to see us taking action indeed, not just some word. So this is going to be a big topic for, for this year, for next year, for all the years to come. Um, here's another way, just reviewing existing practices and policies, policies for the customer experience. Um, there's a lot of different ways in which this manifests, but I'll just take a couple simple ones. One of them is return policy. Like, how complicated is our co-op's return policy? Because at our competitors now, it is not complicated at all. You don't even have to have a receipt. You don't have to do anything. You just say, I want to return this. It doesn't matter why. Um, they will just accept it. Um, now, most of our return policies were created in the context of trying to stop return fraud. That 90% of our co-ops created their return policies with that in mind. So how is it possible that that could be a customer-friendly approach, right? And of course, Target probably experiences a lot of return fraud with their very generous uh, uh, policy, but not enough to alienate shoppers with this process. They've decided consciously we're going to accept that because we want to make it as easy for our customers as possible to change their policy. Um, another way this plays out, one co-op identified that um, they have a lot of language in their ENDS policies around how they treat staff, which is so laudable because we know a lot of companies and organizations around this company don't, right? They, they actually codified it in their ENDS that we are going to be the best employer that we can be, and that's commendable. And this person also identified they have no similar language for how they treat their customer in their ENDS policies. So, so just a couple examples of ways that we might be able to improve on that, and I'm sure there's others that you can think about. Um, and finally, modeling our expectations. Uh, for those of us who are staff members, this is about being what we expect our other staff to do all the time on the sales floor. Um, and that also means being on the sales floor. We can't hide in offices if we're manager positions. That's a thing. Um, but, uh, but it's also something that all of us who are passionate about our co-ops can do. When we are just shoppers, when we're just shopping, when we're members, uh, when we're board members walking through, we have the same ability to identify those ways in which the co-op might not be meeting the needs of, of our customers and point it out. Um, when we first introduced this idea, some people like, kind of freaked out because you know, policy governance roles, you know, I can't talk about operations, this kind of thing. I say that's not necessarily true. Uh, as a shop, you are all professional shoppers. For better or for worse, this country has, has conditioned us to all be professional shoppers. We all know and can identify things that are just not great for the customer. And I would say all of us who care about our co-ops have an obligation to say, hey, there's an end cap in the back. It's totally empty. We need to get that filled. Or I can never come in and find fresh food at 6 o'clock PM. It's always like half crusted over and needing to be replaced. And it's, it, it's not bad to note those things. It might not be our role to fix them. It might not be our role to, to figure out what needs to happen to change that. But all of us have a role in saying, there is a way we can better meet the customer's needs and to, to thoughtfully point that out. Um, we're hesitant to do that. We see it as criticism. We're, we're concerned that maybe what I see as a priority might not be a priority for someone else. I don't know if I give that information to somebody else, if we can fix it. But, um, 
but I think we all have a role to play in this. So I want to just end here by asking, you know, what would it look like? What would it look like if we were to really make gains on all those ways that we think we could do better, to sort of challenge those ways in which we're not doing good enough? What would it look like if our co-ops were living up to this idea of making the customer the heart of our co-ops? And when I think about that, I get really excited because from my perspective, in a world where most companies are trying to find as many ways as possible of kind of moving away from the customer, putting technology in place of people, which I'm not saying is not important. We also have to meet the needs of people through technological resources. But, but you know, replacing people entirely with technology so that we don't have to worry about that, uh, or, or thinking of things that, that have everything to do ex with, with the company except meeting the needs of customers. If we can step into this role, it is so powerful. If we can step into this role, we can have an identity that's built around people and community, and I think that's really important. And in fact, it's so important that next year we're going to stick with the, the, really a very similar idea of the same theme. Everyone uh, welcome, delighting customers, and building community. The idea here being the extent to which we're able to make all of our customers, all the people who come into our door, feel welcome, feel invited, feel like we can meet their needs, is, is proportional to the, the roles in which our co-ops play in the larger community or communities. That, in other words, if, if uh, we can be really good at making our customers the hearts of our co-op, we stand a much better chance of ensuring that our co-ops are the hearts of our communities. We know from talking to shoppers and customers that community is really resonant with all shoppers of all stripes. That community is breaking down at the national level in a lot of ways, and this is a way of addressing that. And we feel really passionately that this is a, a cornerstone upon which the co-op movement can continue to build. So uh, we're going to continue talking about this, and we're going to have a lot more conversations over the coming years. I really look forward to hearing your conversations today around this topic. Thank you so much.